Thing. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for uh, being here today. Uh, Karibuni sana. This is um, Wasiliana Hub Quarter Two. This is our Wasiliana Hub Quarter Two Virtual Mediation Day Symposium for the uh, 2021. Um, and today we are having the session dubbed Ask Me Anything on the Judiciary, uh, on the Naivasha Proposed Judiciary Court Annex Mediation Rules 2020. To kick us off, we will begin with a national anthem like uh, we always do. Uh, it is on your screen. I will walk you through the second, the third stanza in Kiswahili, and then we can proceed. Sorry about that. Um, that to Jenge Taifaletu, Endio Wajibuetu, Kenya Istahili Heshima, Tuungane Mikono Pamoja Kazini, Kila Sikutue na Shukrani. So as I began by saying, this is the Wasiliana Hub Quarter 2 Virtual Mediation Day Symposium uh, for the year 2021. Um, it is uh, the second session and it is a national masterclass. Uh, it is part of the June Continuous Learning Education and Experiential uh, Series for Wasiliana Hub. Um, it is also the fourth effective masterclass for the year 2021. We have had three previous masterclasses two held in April on um, alcohol and uh, drug addiction, as well as abuse. Those ones are available at the Wasiliana Hub YouTube page. Kindly feel free to attend to be able to access those videos. Uh, the third masterclass was the one that was held as, was the session one for this quarter two virtual uh, symposium. And it was on um, insight approach to conflict by our facilitator, by the facilitator of the day, Alena. Um, this one will also be provided at the Wasiliana Hub YouTube page. Kindly uh, feel free to uh, visit and be able to familiarize yourself with those proceedings. June also happens to be the Young Mediator Mentee Month. Um, and this is the this is a month where uh, Wasiliana Hub showcases um, the the young mediators uh, within the community within the Wasiliana Hub community, and they're given an opportunity to uh, be at the front and uh, be able to uh, co connect and engage with peers um, at this level. So our YMM mentee mediator of the month is uh, Sam. Dongo. Sam Dongo is uh, an LLB graduate. He is um, graduated from the National University of Lesotho. He is also uh, an associate of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, and he is also a certified professional mediator. He will also be helping co-moderating this session with me today. So before we proceed and go any further, I will go through the program so that we can be on the same page. Okay, so today what you're going to be looking at is um, the Wasiliana Hub, uh, the Ask Me Anything session with Moses, uh, Honorable Moses Wanjala on the proposed judiciary Naivasha mediation rules. And we will have uh, 
50 minutes where he will give, go through the presentation, take us through the Naivasha, uh, the rules, uh, give us just a better understanding. Following that, we will have a health break. After the health break, this will usher in the second part of the session, which we have dubbed the commentary section. In this section, we will have um, brief commentary and presentation by our guest speaker of the day, Reverend Professor Peter Gishure, and he will be tackling the title, The Role of Judiciary in Conflict Transformation. Following that, this will usher the, the, the session of comments and uh, Q&A with our facilitator. Uh, we hope that uh, most of you have been able to go through the rules and we implore you to take this opportunity to uh, engage with our uh, Honorable Wanjala as much as possible, take advantage of this opportunity to ask any queries, um, uh, engage and uh, get any clarification from him regarding these rules, because as we all know, they impact all of us as mediation prof professionals. Um, to engage uh, during this session, you have two options. You can um, raise your hand with the raise a hand function at the, the, at the task bar, or you can uh, put in your question at the chat function, and then we will usher the, we will uh, forward the question to the facilitator. And with that, I would like to call upon mediator Sam, who will uh, introduce to us our session facilitator for the day, and then we can kickstart the session. Thank you. Karibu sana mediator Sam. Thank you so much for that introduction, <clears throat> Mediator Emerald. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this year, uh, to the second session of the Medi Mediation Wasiliana Hub Mediation Symposium uh, 2021. As mentioned, I am Sam Nyamo. Uh, I'm a young, I'm the young mediator of the month, and I must say it's it's quite an honor. Uh, and I will also be serving as your moderator today. I'm quite excited about today's topic because it marks a new dawn for uh, mediation as a profession and for us as mediators in general. And with that said, uh, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's facilitator, Honorable Moses Wanjala. He'll be walking us through the topic, which is the proposed Naivasha Quarter Next Mediation Rules 2020. To give a brief introduction and bio for um, about our facilitator, he's a magistrate and a regist and the registrar of the Mediation Accreditation Com Committee. He holds a master's degree in international sustainable development from the University of Washington and also serves as the secretary of the uh, Mediation Accreditation Committee rules, um, MAC rules committee. Honorable Wanja uh, Wanjala Karibu. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Emerald. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone else who has found time to attend. If you do allow me, I will put off my video um, so that I, my voice is clear enough. Now, um, I welcome you all to this session. Ask me anything. Yes, it is ask me anything. So you should be as free as possible to ask whatever question you have, as long as it is related to the topic today. Um, maybe before I just uh, do the, 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 the presentation, the first part of our, of our engagement today, let me give a disclaimer that uh, even though it is the rules committee that uh, generated this document, it's still in draft form. And that's the reason why we are having such a session today, so that uh, you give your views, you give your input, and your your views may be incorporated in the in the in the document. We eventually want to have a document that is good enough, a document that uh, should be able to serve us in to posterity, and that's why we have. Uh, tried our level best to reach out to all the stakeholders. And we recognize that uh, our mediators and Wasiliana Hub is one such critical stakeholder that we can't leave out. We had, uh, I think we had sent out this document uh, earlier before, 
but I think uh, having such a one-on-one -on -one interaction with you should be able to elicit uh, a lot of contribution and enriching in this document. So feel free to ask anything. Nothing is wrong. Nothing is uh, absolutely wrong or right. So uh, feel free to, 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 to ask anything. I think the, the, the session is being recorded so that uh, your views and your comments should be, will be uh, forwarded to the rules committee for purposes of uh, enriching this document. Now, um, Cota Next Mediation has been with us since 2016, precisely 4th of April, 2016. So by 4th of April this year, we are about, we were five years old. When the program started in, uh, in 2016, it was supposed to be run as a pilot. So we uh, rules were crafted to govern the pilot stage. They were called quarter next mediation rules. And they, they ran from the 4th of April, which was supposed to run for six months up to December 2016, but which was extended uh, for a further six months again. So the pilot came to an end around July of 2017. And so was the, 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 the rules that were governing the program then. Uh, after, the, after July 2017, the judiciary has been applying uh, practice directions, which were gazetted by the Chief Justice. And uh, for those who may not understand this, there is a, a very big difference between rules and practice directions because rules have a more uh, force, uh, a bigger force of law compared to practice directions. Rules follow a certain process. They have to be uh, to go through stakeholder and public participation. They have to go to the attorney general. They have to be gazetted. They have to be taken to parliament. And parliament has to give a nod before they take effect. Practice directions are merely issued by the chief justice to govern a certain uh, aspect. But they, they, they don't go through the whole process. So they don't have such a bigger force of law as compared to rules. In fact, practice directions are only supposed to come in as a stopgap measure for purposes of addressing a, an urgent need, but then you need to craft, uh, to formalize rules that should uh, then take over the process. So these rules were in fact supposed to have been crafted in 2017. Immediately, uh, the pilot rules came to an end. But uh, we thought that it was wise for us to learn, to experience, and to see how the terrain is before we can, we can, we can craft uh, rules. So that the experiences that we've been learning since 2016 have informed what is now contained in these rules. The rules are prepared. They are being made by the rules committee of the judiciary because that is the committee that is mandated to make rules within the judiciary. The rules committee of which I sit as a secretary is uh, established under section 81 of the Civil Procedure Act. And under section 81 FF, that section requires the rules committee to make rules to govern a uh, court and next mediation. So these rules, the ones that we, we I will take you through today are uh, crafted not by Mark, not by the court uh, next mediation team, but by the rules committee of the judiciary. But like I said, uh, all stakeholders, including mediators, have to have to be involved. The other thing I want to point out is that rules, the, the making of rules takes a process. You have to come up with the draft. You have to take the the, the draft to the stakeholders to have their input. You have to incorporate the input of the stakeholders. Then you have to generate the final draft. You have to call the stakeholders to a validation meeting. So where we are right now is uh, the stakeholder engagement and public participation. And that's why I'm saying that uh, we, your, your, your views and your comments really count as of now. Then uh, once we get your views uh, uh, alongside those that you have received from the other stakeholders, 
we will uh, the rules committee will again sit and incorporate those views and comments we did the first round um sometimes last year and we received views from quite a number of people and stakeholders and the rules committee had a meeting in naivasha towards the end of last year i think in november last year so this is not the first draft this is a, a, a review a revised draft after incorporating the first round of comments from uh, stakeholders that's why we are calling it the post naivasha draft because we had a draft before then but then uh, we're still going on with the stakeholder engagement after we get uh, further views we will incorporate and we will then call you for national validation at that stage you will confirm to us whether we have incorporated your comments and we will also tell you for those that we have not incorporated we will tell you why and then uh, after we we validate the document it will be forwarded to the attorney general then the attorney general's office will forward it will will, uh, will will go through to just confirm that it is in sync with other provisions of the law that the rules do not contravene other um, acts of parliament then they will send the draft back to the chief justice who who will sign it and then forward to the government printer for gazettement once it has once the rules will have been gazetted the law requires that uh, within seven days the draft is forwarded to the parliament there is a subcommittee on delegated legislation which will go through and ensure that you have complied with everything in fact when you forward to parliament you have to forward it alongside the the, the memorandum and the, the evidence to show that public participation was done so once the the the, the, the parliament confirms that all processes the right processes have been followed then they will write to us telling us that the rules are okay and then they can now take effect so the rules cannot take effect unless they are gazetted and they cannot take effect unless uh, the, 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 the the parliament gives us the nod to go ahead so essentially that is how the process uh, will take place now this draft was uh, this draft um, it like i said it draws on uh, the experiences that we have had since 2017 on the on the program so far so some of the things you will find here were in our initial draft the one that uh, that governed the pilot stage some of them are in the practice directions but a lot has been informed by the experiences that we have had so far uh, there are quite a number of new things that are introduced in these rules. Uh, let me point out some of the salient features that you'll find in these rules. Uh, the rules right now govern both virtual and physical mediations. That was not in the initial draft and it was not in the, that was not in the pilot rules and it is not in the practice directions. I think this has been informed by the challenges that were brought about by COVID-19. So the rules, for those who have read it, you realize that uh, they make provision, they, they refer both to virtual and physical mediations. The other salient feature is uh, the issue of attendance at a mediation. Uh, I know some in the last, in the last session was uh, really worried about uh, being required to attend uh, to, to, to attend mentorship and you don't know where you can you can get the mentorship as the judiciary we are alive to that and that's why we introduced the fact that you can apply for accreditation and you are provisional accredited our idea was that we will then run an, a mentorship program within the judiciary but the challenge we had then is that we needed we needed to have proper guidelines in place before you can roll out such a program, a mentorship program within the judiciary. Right now, there is a, there are mentorship guidelines that have been prepared with the help of our consultant, and they will be validated. Uh, the validation is tomorrow. Uh, this the, the attendance at a mediation recognizes that a mentee can attend a mediation. So once this is in the rules. 
then it will open up the door for us to now start implementing our mentorship program within the judiciary because then the rules allow a mentee to attend a mediation. Of course, there are certain guidelines that will be put in place for that. So it, it is a new feature that will enable us uh, then uh, implement a mentorship program. The other critical part of the rules is a partial settlements on how partial settlements should be dealt with. And when the file goes back to court, what happens with it? I know right now the file goes back to court. It can be given a date next year. And uh, probably the, the parties had agreed on four points, on four issues. Only one issue remained and uh, uh, only they were not able to agree on only one of the issues. So if you give them a far off date, then uh, what happens with these other four issues that they were able to agree? Due to passage of time, probably they can go back or even on those ones that they had already agreed. So we try to address that. So there is a, there is a section, there is a, a rule that deals with the partial settlements. Critically, and this I should elicit uh, views from you people on setting aside. I know the rules provide that you cannot appeal against a mediated settlement. Uh, there was a heated argument when we were in Naivasha with some of the members of the rules committee who were wondering what happens to a mediation, a mediated settlement where circumstances really require that uh, that settlement, even though it is in place, that it can be set aside. Like, how do I, how can I live with that settlement agreement forever if there are circumstances that will clearly warrant that it be set aside? And in fact, I remember one of the one of the members uh, pointing out that uh, if you have, uh, if you, if you, if you are, if you are mediating. And uh, for example, both of you are not aware that you are mediating a succession case and both of you are not aware that there is a house in Eldoret. Okay, both of you assume that there is a house in Eldoret that you are supposed to give to party A and then party B takes the house in Nairobi. But then after the settlement agreement has been signed, you realize that uh, it was a common mistake. That house is no longer in existence. The house in Eldoret is no longer in existence. Um, it's not available to party B. Probably it got burned down or something happened to it. Can you reopen the mediation? Can you, can you relook at that settlement agreement? And the, the judges who are members of the committee were of the view that I think that parties can, where circumstances warrant, there should be room where parties can look at that settlement agreement and see whether it can be reviewed. Of course, it's, uh, it, it, it is, uh, we need to see your views and your comments on that. And then of course, critically is the section on private settlement agreements. Uh, there is a provision of the law, I think section 59D, which says that a private settlement agreement may be adopted and enforced by the court. These are settlement agreements that are reached up, uh, by the parties outside there without filing a case in court. The law requires that you can present that settlement agreement to court, it be adopted and enforced. But no one has done so to date, I think because there's no procedure for doing that. So these rules have tried to address that so that uh, you can now be able to bring your, your settlement agreement to court for purposes of adoption. There is also a bit on uh, international mediations, mediations that are done uh, outside of this country. How can they be adopted by the court and then enforced by this court? So if you've looked at the, those rules, those are some of the new features that you'll find in this draft that was not in the pilot draft and that is not in the practice directions. So generally, those are the new features that you find in these rules. Um, is there is a, is a 52 rules the rules are from number one to 52 there are five parts so uh briefly i if you go through i don't know whether 
you would want to share the screen, Emerald, or if you don't, have, if you have the draft rules, you can share the screen. Um, but members can also just scroll through. Um, so the first part is just the general part. The short title, what are next mediation rules 2020? And, and, and please be open in your mind. You can comment on anything, including the title of the rules. Is it appropriate? I know 2020 will change to 2021. But even just calling these rules, quote and next mediation rules, is it a proper title? Can it be changed? Should it be changed? Those are some of the things you need to think about. And if you have a better idea, please bring it on board. So they are caught our next mediation rules 2020. Section two generally is the interpretation. You can go through the interpretation and see interpretation is not, is, is not so unimportant. It is a very critical part of the rules because it, 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 may, mean, it may mean a whole difference. For example, the definition of a court, what does court mean? You realize here, we have said that court means the high court, the environment and land court, the employment and labor relations court, the subordinate courts, and the subordinate courts includes the Kazi's courts and even tribunals. So that these rules will apply to mediations uh, happening in all those courts. Uh, the court of appeal has been excluded because in their rules, which they are amending right now, they have a part on, uh, on, on court and next mediation. So we thought we can exclude that. And I think the same also happens with the Supreme Court. So all the subordinate courts, the high court and the other courts of concurrent jurisdiction, uh, the specialized courts are, 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 co are covered by these rules. Um, Court record includes the physical file as well as electronic or digital file. And this is critically to, to, to cover both the virtual and physical mediation. So if a document is filed electronically, it forms part of the court record. Uh, filing includes physical filing and uh, uploading of documents on the judiciary portal. Uh, mediation deputy registrar, those ones, the, the, the ones that are, are, are in, in, uh, in each court that is implementing the, the quarter next mediation program, include the magistrate, includes a cargo. So mediation deputy registrar, because there are courts where there is no, a deputy registrar is only uh, in the high court. So if it is a subordinate court, and it is headed by a magistrate. The magistrate who is in charge of the mediation for the, for the, for the, for the purposes of these rules shall be a mediation deputy registrar. Um, party private mediation agreement, a qualified mediator, those are the definitions. So the rules apply to settlement agreements under the court next mediation program and private settlement agreements that are presented to court for adoption. Rule four, establishment of registry. The rules are requiring now that uh, registries, mediation so registry across the country. That is all about part A, that is general. Part B is now the mediation program itself. Referral to mediation, this is covered by the act. And it says that all matters uh, filed after the commencement of the rules shall be subject to mandatory screening. Those that are found suitable shall be referred to mediation. Uh, the pending matters may be screened before those ones that are judgment has not been issued. And also it allows parties to refer cases to mediation by consent. Uh, section 59B that is being referred to here and 59C is the one that gives residual powers to the court to refer a matter to mediation. Now this one is not through screening where a case is pending before a judicial officer, that judicial officer may decide to refer a matter to mediation uh, 
notwithstanding the fact that the case has not gone has not been screened so you don't really have to go through screening procedure on uh, procedure on screening uh, th this one just provides on how screening shall be done in the family division after close of pleadings or where it is uh, appropriate um, after screening the judicial officer or the screening officer shall endorse on the file that the matter has been screened and either found suitable or not um, if the screening officer finds that is not suitable for referral to mediation he shall also uh, endorse on the file and give reasons as to why the case is not suitable for mediation the screening criteria is also at rule number seven generally this is a very open um, a very open uh, criteria all matters are suitable for mediation that is the, the starting point unless it falls in any of the categories that uh, that, that we don't deem them to be fit for referral to mediation now uh, in screening the screening officer shall shall consider quite a number of things including the the age of the case is it a too, too old case is it a too new or fresh matter the value of the matter in subject matter involved whether the issues being raised are pure points of law is it a public interest litigation case or is it a case that will benefit the parties if it was referred to mediation or not so these are just a guideline uh, where the screening officer shall, shall use as a checklist to see whether it can be referred to mediation. So we didn't give a closed list. We didn't want to, to like channel, in to, 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 we didn't want to, to guard the screening officer in, what, in how, how far they can go in determining whether or not the case should be referred to mediation. Section eight generally talks about the mediation file or register and it requires the courts to maintain such a register. Uh, there are quite a number of things that uh, should be included in that register. They are listed there at sub rule two, the date of referral to mediation, the type of the case, the original case number, the value of the subject matter, all the way to the outcome of the mediation, the date of the filing of the mediator's report, and the date when the claim for payment, the claim for payment was done and any other relevant uh, remark so that someone looking at that register will be able to know everything that has happened in that file from the date it was screened to the date the settlement agreement was, out, was, was, was adopted by the court to the date when uh, payment was done um it also says that uh sub rule three that uh, a mediation separate mediation file shall be open for each file for each matter referred to mediation so the first one is the register and the number at, at sub rule three is the mediation file which shall contain a copy of the order referring the case to mediation the case summaries in any interim orders that were issued attendance sheets and uh, a copy of the non-compliance report if any now the mediation file is confidential and it shall be kept by at the mediation registry uh section nine has some some uh, some, some some timelines uh after screening and if the matter is found suitable for referral to mediation the parties shall be notified within seven days and they shall be required to file case summaries under within seven days that is in a prescribed form number one and form number two there is a proviso which says that uh, regardless of the fact that a case summary has not been filed, the mediator may still proceed with the matter. So it's not mandatory that you wait for the, for the, for the case summary, because from experience, we've realized that this delays the cases quite a number of times. So you can nevertheless proceed with the mediation. Uh, but I think, uh, Rule number 10, service. Service may be effected physically or electronically or by post, and we will use the address that was either given in the initial uh, 
case, the one that is in court or in the case summary. So that is the address that we will use. Section 11 talks about the mediators and uh, generally it says that the mediators are those that are listed on the on the on the on the on the register that is maintained by mark and whose status is active so if your status is not active you will not be eligible for to be issued with a matter and the register shall be continually updated uh, and the mediators shall uh, shall subscribe and be bound by a code of conduct and there shall be the, the each station implementing the program shall be required to forward complaints to the committee within seven days of receipt of the complaint the mediation deputy registrar shall be required to be forwarding to the committee annual confidential reports on the performance of the mediators this is generally for purposes of just improving the program and our performance not for any secretive uh, activity, so that we know how you, uh, the mediators are working and if there is any need for any interventions for better performance. Rule number 12 is on appointment of mediators. I know there have been a lot of complaints on this. It's not easy to fix this, but you have tried in these rules to require that uh, you appoint a mediator um, within seven days and the mediator has to communicate back indicating that uh, they have accepted the appointment um, or if there is a, a conflict of interest they tell us that uh, there is a conflict of interest so we will not uh, take up the matter parties may by consent uh, adopt uh, appoint a mediator of their choice and that should be communicated within seven days of the receipt of the notification under sub rule one sub rule five allocation of cases to mediators shall be done chronologically down the list of mediators so if a court number c has 15 mediators you allocate cases from number one all the way to number 15 and you go back to number one unless there are peculiar circumstances probably a particular mediator is not within the country or this particular matter is one that will require a particular mediator to deal with it and if that is done then the mediation deputy registrar will need to note on the mediation file and the register the reasons why they picked mediator number 10 and not mediator number seven now, um, the mediation deputy registrar shall ensure that the cases are distributed as equitably as possible. So in accordance with the skills, availability, experience, and so on, so that we don't have a uh, complaint that so-and-so has many matters and so-and-so does not have matters. Uh, there will be mentions. There will be mention uh, within 14 days of the appointment of a mediator. The matter shall be mentioned before the deputy registrar. It may be conducted, that mention may be done virtually. And uh, if uh, it is in the interest of the, of the judicial officer, may direct that uh, a particular mediator does attend that mention. The mention is for purposes of the court notifying the parties that their matter has been referred to mediation, probably engage them on the processes and hand them over to the mediator so that uh, the parties are aware that this is a court process. And there may be further mentions um, so that uh, the mediator can request that a matter be mentioned. That is a sub rule number five. The mediator or any party to the dispute may request that a matter pending in mediation be listed for mention. Um, commencement of mediation. The initial mediation session shall be conducted within 14 days from the date of the mention under sub rule 13. Under rule 13, then the mediator shall fix the initial mediation session and shall notify the parties. So where there is a, a mediation, where there is a mention as under rule 13, 
and a mediator attends, then the first session shall be conducted on that day. So parties come, the court, the, the, the deputy registrar tells them about the processes and hands them over to the mediator who is present in court. Then the mediator goes with the parties to have the initial meeting and then uh, fix another date. Of course, where the mediator is not in attendance, then uh, the mediator will be notified to fix the, to the initial meeting as soon as possible, but within 14 days. Now, rule 15 is the attendance at the mediation. Um, you can, if you go through that, you realize that it has now been, a, uh, been um, made a little bit more flexible. Um, a party may attend, they may, may be accompanied by an advocate or a representative of their choice. You have to give details and your role. If you are a representative, who are you and what is your role in the mediation? It has to be disclosed in the first meeting so that uh, parties don't wonder who is this stranger who is attending our mediation. So they are may, it may be a company, it may be a natural person. Uh, if it is a, a natural person uh, at the initial session, the representative shall, shall, uh, shall, 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 shall require that a signed authority be given to the mediator to show that you have the authority to represent that person because without such authority you may engage in a, in a futile exercise where the, the, the party himself may later on discount and say that they didn't give any such authority. If it is a company, a corporation, a government, or a government agency, You can proceed. Okay, so so the state council, uh, we have tried to address that issue here. Then there will be attendance sheets, of course, that has been informed by practice, which have to be signed. Remember, some of the mediations may be done outside of the court. So you have to ensure that attendance sheets have been signed. And all these are in prescribed forms. The attendance sheets are in prescribed form number nine. The place and time of conducting mediation, this is also very liberal. It may be done virtually, it may be done physically, it may be done within the court premises, it may be done elsewhere, it may be done on any day, at any time, of course, uh, considering the safety also. But you can even do it at 8 p.m. as long as it is uh, the parties, all the parties are comfortable and the mediator is comfortable as well. You can decide to do the mediation on a Saturday afternoon because probably the parties are engaged during the office hours. So um, wherever you hold the mediation, you will not be, you will not charge any extra fees or expense to the parties. Uh, if, the, if the physical mediation is conducted elsewhere other than within the court premises, the mediator shall ensure neutrality and if need be, make necessary arrangement with the court to provide security because some of these mediations may turn nasty. Agreement to mediate that has to be signed by the parties in the prescribed form and the mediator has to present it on the initial meeting so that the parties sign uh, the engagement, the rules of engagement. It's what we call rules of engagement, but essentially it is an agreement to mediate. Confidentiality and admissibility rule 18. All parties taking part in the mediation, including those that are attending the mediation, are supposed to maintain confidentiality and not to admit uh, no, 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 they, they do not be required to admit, to, to make an admission of what went through in the mediation at a subsequent proceeding if there will be one. Now, um, sub rule three. Um, the, it gives exceptions to what may be disclosed. Um, sub rule five. 
you may not be compelled to testify. Sub rule six, you are not required to record. And sub rule seven, a breach of those confidentiality rules amounts to contempt of court, where you can actually be, be jailed. Now, rule 19, um, at every mediation session, unless otherwise agreed, the parties who may attend are the parties themselves, the advocates or their representatives. Uh, if you were to be represented by a person who is not an advocate, you will only be entitled to one representative at a time. Actually, we do not want to crowd the whole room with people who may, who may, who, who, who may not be doing anything. So you may have one representative. Uh, a law firm shall be required to allocate that mediation to a particular advocate so that you don't have advocates changing each time you come for a particular session. And rule four, sub rule four, with the prior consent of the parties, prior consent is very critical. Um, these are the parties who may attend, mediators who are on the list and who are under mentorship program. And this, like I said, is for purposes of uh, uh, helping us ro roll out the mentorship program within the judiciary but you will be required to have a letter from the mediation registrar from Mark, indicating that you are under mentorship and you are allowed to attend in a particular mediation. An advocate who is holding brief for another advocate may attend or a pupil in that law firm. But all these uh, under sub rule five, they shall be bound by rules of confidentiality and they shall sign a confidentiality agreement in the first session. The mediator shall ensure that only authorized persons are, are attending and that the, 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 the requisite consents have been obtained from the parties before they are allowed to attend in the mediation. The role of an advocate to the mediation, it has been addressed under Rule 20 to ensure that uh, parties respect the notices given by the mediator to assist the parties explore various options to adopt an advisory role and to cooperate with the mediator during the mediation session. Now, non-compliance under Rule 21, um, if you consistently fail to comply, you may be cited for contempt of court. Um, Before you file a non-compliance report as a mediator, you will be required to first list the matter for mention so that the deputy registrar can address whatever issue that is that might be holding the matter back. But after the mention and you can't still proceed, move forward, then you will file a non-compliance report under form number 12. Um, and it shall be the obligation of the mediator to, to certify himself that he has done some effort to at least move the mediation process forward. And this is because of the issue of payment. I know this is very critical and it has been addressed severally. Nowadays, we pay a uniform figure of 20,000 shillings, whether you procured a full settlement, a partial settlement or a non-compliance. And unfortunately, we've realized that for some mediators, they just show up one session, they file a non-compliance report. There will be a graduated payment, a prorated payment, so that for non-compliance cases, if you show that you did effort, you should, uh, we should see that effort. You will not just be automatically entitled to 20,000. It doesn't mean that you are forcing the parties to agree but at least uh, put in some effort so that there is value for money. Notices should be sent, notices should be, uh, at least show us that you did something before we can pay you the full amount. So sub rule four is de deliberately uh, addressing the issue of uh, 
your efforts as a mediator to move the process forward. Now, consequences for non-compliance are there under Rule 22. The parties with those pleadings may be struck out, you may be ordered to pay costs, you may be ordered to go for further mediation. To Rule 23, conclusion of the mediation process, it may be concluded after the expiry of 50 day, 60 days from the date the mediator was notified of his appointment, or it, it will be concluded after the filing of a non-compliance report or the filing of a settlement agreement. Um, the court may order further mediation. That one, I think I have addressed that. For example, where there is a non-compliance, or where it, it is in the, the court deems it fit. The mediation settlement agreement shall be in form number 13, of course, subject to modifications. It shall be signed by the parties, their advocates or representatives, as well as the mediator. And that settlement agreement uh, shall be filed in court within 10 days and issue a copies of the signed agreement to the parties. Now, this is critical because we want what has been filed in court to be the one that you serve to the parties. Because if you serve the settlement agreement to the parties before it is filed, and it turns out later on that party A has a different agreement from what party B has, then how will the court own up that agreement? Because what is filed in court is what will be adopted by the court as a judgment of the court. So you make enough copies, present it to court for, for filing, they will be stamped, once they have been stamped, then you can serve to the parties because that is now a court document. The mediator's report is in form number 14. It has to be filed within 10 days of the conclusion of the mediation. The adoption is laid out in rule number 27. It shall be placed before the judicial officer or the judge within 10 days for adoption and it shall not be necessary that parties or the mediator attend court for purposes of adoption, but where the court deems it necessary or if it may, it, if it, it may, it wants, it, it wants to, it may seek further clarification from the mediator or the parties before it adopts. Probably it is, the settlement agreement is not very clear enough. Now, directions on partial settlements. Uh, you have to prepare a partial settlement where not all of the issues have been uh, have been agreed upon. It shall be in form number 15. The agreement shall where the parties request indicate any specific directions or assistance that they would like the court to, to grant for expeditious resolution of the remaining the issues. So for example, you agree on four issues. There is one remaining issue you can't agree, but you would want to in, inform court on what direction the court can give so that you, you resolve that issue speedily. For example, you can tell court that we were not able to, to agree on this issue because we would want the land to be, to be, to be, to be valued before we can move forward. So th those directions, uh, the mediator shall put in his report, and that may assist the court in uh, dealing with the remaining issues. Now, if the remaining issue was costs, if that is what it, it was an issue at the mediation as to who should pay costs or how much costs should be paid, then it is a partial settlement. Because you, you don't uh, agree until you have agreed on everything, including costs. So if it comes up as an issue and you can't agree, it will be treated as a partial settlement you need the court to determine. Because the issue of course is an issue, an independent issue on its own. Now the partial settlement will of course be adopted like a, a, full, a full settlement agreement, but it will, be, it will be placed, the file will be placed before the court and the court will uh, give directions on how it can be determined, but it has to determine it on priority basis within 90 days from the date the directions are made. So you, you, you fast track the determination of the remaining issues. I think this is, this, this is what I was saying that we, we needed to address 
uh, that matter. And then um, enforcement, of course, the decrees, you, it's adopted, you extract a decree, and then you proceed and uh, enforce like any other decree of the court. Time stops running from the time the matter is referred to mediation. So rule 30 generally just talks about time. Mediation shall take 60 days. Um, the court may extend time for 10 days under sub rule three. And the parties may also extend time by consent. Rule that one court may give interim measures pending the determination of the case of the mediation so that uh, prob probably you may need to conservatory orders to conserve the, the subject matter. So you may move the court for conservatory orders that cannot be issued by a mediator. Rule 32 is what I was talking about, setting aside. You can't make this application for setting aside unless you first of all seek the leave of the court. So you make an application, the court has to look at it and assure itself that it absolutely is a necessary situation that a party can apply to set aside a settlement agreement that has been adopted. And in the application for leave, you, file, you support it with an affidavit that details the grounds upon which you, you intend to, 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 to set aside the decree or the order that may have uh, uh, emanated from the settlement agreement. Now, we have attempted to give grounds under sub rule three, but it's not a closed list. For example, after the, the, after the settlement agreement, you realize that the mediator had misconducted himself or there was fraud, money changed hands. And you see, uh, you're realizing that when you already have a settlement agreement or there was a fundamental mistake of the parties or the, the one party misrepresented, you lied to the other party that uh, this and this was the correct position but uh, it has later been realized that it was not the correct position. You presented a false document, you presented a false title to the other party and relying on that fake title, the other party gave you a consent or a settlement agreement. Is it a ground that the court may revisit? Is it something that you must live with for the rest of your life because you can't appeal? And I think that was the argument being raised, but it's upon you to give your views and see whether these grounds are okay. Uh, fundamental mistake, where the settlement agreement is invalid. You make a settlement agreement that is invalid. Uh, how do you go about it? Um, then 33 is, was in, even in the initial uh, pilot rules, the immunity of the mediator. Then 34 on payment of mediators. You present your claim for payment and a scale of payment will have to be prepared, a scale of payment of fees for, for and will be reviewed from time to time. This is uh, geared towards addressing the issue of uh, uh, matters that have taken off and been uh, gone through the whole process and those ones that there is a non-compliance. For remuneration of advocates, the CJ, the Chief Justice, shall make a, 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 a remuneration order so that our advocates uh, can charge fees for mediation. Part C is on registration, recognition, and enforcement of private mediation agreements. So this is what I was saying, that these are mediations that have been conducted outside of uh, the court. And the act actually talks of a qualified mediator. So who is a qualified mediator? That is what we've been grappling with. So this section is to, this part is to give effect to the provisions of Article 159 and Section 59D. So a qualified mediator is described under Section 37. Uh, you must, uh, you, you, a qualified mediator is one who is either accredited by the committee right now, whether you are active or not, or you are accredited by another institution, for example, the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, or you possess other further qualifications that may be approved by the committee. 
And this we are opening up so that uh, mediations can go on outside there as freely as possible. You don't have to apply to this committee for accreditation before you can conduct mediations outside there. So as long as you have uh, you are accredited by MAC or you are accredited by any other institution that the committee recognizes, or you have written a letter to the committee and the committee has approved that you are a qualified media. So there will be a list of institutions that the committee recognizes and there will be a list of qualified mediators that is separate from the MAC accredited mediators. So for those ones, I generally will not be requiring them to, 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 to pay accreditation fees or to renew the accreditation. Just so that we recognize so that when you show up with a settlement agreement, we know that you are a good, you are a mediator that, that possesses some qualifications. Um, so you are not accredited by us, but we know you. And when you are apply, when you are presenting that settlement agreement to court for adoption, you attach that letter from Mark showing that you are recognized as a qualified mediator. So we'll maintain and publish a list of recognized institutions. And we will also maintain and publish a list, uh, publish a list of our qualified mediators. Okay. Um, so the, the, you present your settlement agreement to the registry. The registry will have a register of private mediation agreements. Um, so for that private mediation agreement to be registered, it has to be reached with the assistance of a qualified mediator. It has to relate to a dispute that is not subject to a pending court case. It has to relate to a dispute that is capable of being resolved by mediation under Kenyan or international law. It must not be an illegal settlement agreement. It must be capable of being enforced by, by the court. It must be reduced into writing in the language of the court. It must be dated and signed by the mediator and all the parties to the dispute, their advocates or representative. It must indicate the place where the mediation took place. It must have resolved all the issues in dispute. And this is critical because we don't want you, we don't want a party to file a case in court on one dispute, on one issue, and then tell us that the other issues were resolved in mediation. So if you can't agree, then just file the case in court for all the issues. But we don't want you to, to agree on some issues and then file a case on the other issues because it will be confusing to us. So you have to agree on all the issues and it must concisely uh, indicate the nature of the dispute. The mode of presentation, you present it within 30 days of its signing. Of course, that was just a period that we, we placed it there, but if you have any other contrary opinion on that, you are free to say so. You will present it to the nearest mediation registry from where it was concluded. Uh, the presentation of the settlement agreement shall be done by the mediator and it shall be presented in court as an annexure or an attachment to an affidavit sworn by the mediator. So the mediator swears an affidavit saying that I was a mediator in this matter. The parties referred this mediation to me. We sat at this place. We were able to resolve all the disputes. It's not an illegal uh, settlement agreement. I can confirm that the signatures on the settlement agreement are for those parties and I saw them sign it and so on. And then you now attach the settlement agreement uh, to that affidavit. Um, you then present it to court for adoption. The, the, the affidavit, I think the latter part of that uh, rule just gives us uh, what the affidavit should provide. Uh, and then when it is presented to court under rule 41, the court shall endorse on the affidavit and the next just, and it shall stamp them. It shall assess fees payable, if any, and you know, for affidavits, I think right now we only pay 75 shillings. Then it shall be serialized, it shall be given a number, and then it shall be placed in a register of private mediation agreements. 
We don't know whether a dispute will arise out of it on enforcement or not. So we don't want to preempt. We just present it to us, we stamp it, we serialize it, and we place it in a register. That is recognition. Now, once all that has been, pro has been followed, then it shall be recognized as forming part of the record of the court. Now, under Rule 43, should, the part, should it become necessary that you now wish to enforce, probably one of the parties has reneged, then you now come back to court, you file an application for execution. Uh, it should be in form number 17, indicating that you intend to enforce the settlement agreement. When we receive your application, we will then open a file for your settlement agreement. We open a file just the same way a court file is opened. Then we place that file before a court within 14 days for adoption. Once it is adopted by the court, a decree shall issue, and then it is that decree that we will enforce. So when you visit our courts, you will find a register of so many settlement agreements but probably those that have disputes in enforcement are the ones that we'll open files for because it has to be adopted by the court as a judgment of the court. A decree has to be issued before you can execute. You only execute a, a decree, you don't execute the settlement agreement. So um, during the hearing of your application, the court may order that the parties be, be, that, that the parties be served and the court may order that uh, the, 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 the court may, uh, may hear the affected party before it sets aside. So you may set aside a settlement agreement or you may uh, uh, adopt it. So the court may require that uh, parties attend and that it hears them. So if it has uh, then rule number 44, all the way to rule number 52, I think it talks all the way on this part, it talks about uh, international private mediation agreements. Uh, a, a, an international private mediation agreement may be enforced under this part, and uh, it will be regarded as an international private mediation agreement if uh, it is between individuals who are nationals of more than one country. And if a dispute is between uh, corporate bodies, there are, are, are bodies that are incorporated in more than one country, or the subject matter is situated in, in, in a country that is separate from uh, where the proceedings were done. Um, an international private settlement agreement shall not be registered unless it is valid under Kenyan or international law. It meets the requirements set out in rule number 39. I think rule 39 is uh, where we talked about the attributes of a private settlement agreement in this country. And either of the parties is a Kenyan or is ordinarily resident in Kenya or the subject matter is situated in Kenya or the mediation proceedings were conducted in Kenya or the agreement was concluded in Kenya or the enforcement of that agreement is expected to be done in Kenya. And it has also to be done by a qualified mediator. Mm -hmm. So if Mark does not recognize you, we will not adopt your settlement agreement. So you have to first of all be uh, recognized as a qualified mediator. Um, before registering an international private mediation agreement, the court shall certify itself that it is complies with the provisions of sub rule three above and may for sufficient reasons to be recorded, decline to register. Um, part D is generally just on virtual mediations. The rules are applicable to virtual mediations as, this, as, as they appear, uh, apply to physical mediations. The court may adopt, develop and adopt appropriate uh, protocols and uh, guide, standard guidelines for virtual mediations. I think we left this open because this, this keeps on changing from time to time. So or even like right now we have guidelines for virtual mediations. They may need to be changed after some time. So we left that open. The court will be adopting uh, different guidelines and protocols from time to time. 
Rule 47, virtual mediations are as valid as uh, physical mediations. Yeah, and then rule uh, part E is miscellaneous. The power of the court, uh, it's not limited. The court can give directions and notices to the mediator and to the parties as it deems fit to facilitate effective and expeditious conduct of mediations. The court has also been given residual power to extend time where it deems fit. And uh, applications under this rule shall be made by a notice of motion and may be disposed of virtually or physically. These rules may be amended from time to time as need arises. And the rules then repeal the practice directions that were gazetted in 2017. So the, generally those are the rules. I don't know whether I've taken one hour, two hours, 50 minutes or less, but uh, those, that, that is, uh, that's how the rules appear. So like I said, this is just what we've managed to come up with, but we really now call for your, for your views and comments. Thank you. Honorable Anjala for taking us uh, through that. Um, at this point, we will go for a five minute uh, health break. It is now 5.32. We will come back at uh, 5.37 so that we can proceed and um, go now move forward to the next uh, commentary by Professor Peter Gishure, Reverend Professor Peter Gishure, and then we will have our commentary session and our uh, moment to be able to um, ask, uh, engage with Honorable Wanjala um, on the rules. Thank you so much. See you in a few minutes. Welcome back again, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is the Wasiliana Hub um, session two of, uh, this is the, the Wasiliana Hub quarter two virtual mediation symposium for the year 2021. And we are currently going through session two, uh, which is on ask me anything uh, for the, on the Naivasha proposed judiciary court annex mediation rules 2020. Our session facilitator for the day has been Honorable Moses Wanjala. Um, and he has, we have just gone through the, the phase where he has taken us through the rules. And uh, this has ushered in the second uh, session, which is on the commentary section. <clears throat> This, just a brief introduction, um, this session two is uh, part of the, it's a national masterclass and it is part of the June Continuous Learning Education and Experiential Series. Uh, it is also the fourth effective mediator masterclass. Feel, feel free to um, reach out to visit the YouTube page, the Wasiliana Hub YouTube page to be able to access uh, the three uh, previous, um, uh, effective masterclasses, the ones that we have held prior to this, including the one that is session one for this quarter two, that is, um, that was on insight on conflict approach. Um, so June is also the Young Mediator Mentee Month. Uh, and this is also the opportunity, that, uh, it's an opportunity that Wasiliana uh, takes to highlight and showcase uh, the young mediators uh, within the community and give them an opportunity to also engage with peers on this level. So with that being said, uh, we will now move through to the second session where we will be having a presentation by Professor, Reverend Professor Peter Gishure. Uh, I will call upon mediator Sam Nyamu, who is our young mediator mentee of the month. He is an LLB graduate. Um, uh, he holds an LLB degree from the University of um, Lesotho. He is an associate of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and he's also a certified professional mediator. So I will call upon mediator Sam Nyamo. He will introduce, give us a brief bio on uh, our next uh, guest speaker, Professor Reverend Professor Peter Gishure, and then we can proceed to the presentation. Karibu sana mediator Sam. Asante sana, Mediator Emerald. Um, I'll jump into it. Our guest speaker for the, for the day, as you said, um, is Reverend Prophet Peter Gishure. 
He's an associate professor of the dogm of dogm dogmatic theology and peace studies at the Catholic University of East Africa. Actually, um, just before we started this session, um, Prof, uh, I remember you mentioned that you were giving a lecture on conflict. Maybe you will tell you you you'll touch a bit on that when you're giving your presentation. Um, but to add on to his bio. Um, Professor, Reverend Professor Peter Geshure also holds a doctorate in theology and religious studies, as well as a master's in peace studies from the University of Notre Dame in the US. If he's not serving the Catholic Diocese of Nakuru, where he serves as a priest, Reverend Prophet Geshure works with the Catholic Justice and Peace Commission in Kenya, where he plays an advisory role and his area of focus is elevation of poverty and sustainable development. With that said, I'd like to welcome Reverend Prophet, Professor Gishure to take the floor. Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, my topic is the role of the judiciary in conflict transformation. Uh, as you all know that uh, for a long time, the judiciary always concentrated on what we normally call retributive justice, where people are punished for the offenses they committed and uh, in the hope that they are going to be rehabilitated or they will be corrected and be uh, absorbed back to the community and continue their lives there. Uh, that has been something that has been uh, disturbing because uh, this system seemed not to work for everybody. Uh, in the last uh, two decades or so, there have been a claim for what we normally call restorative justice. Uh, restorative justice is, is anything that uh, uh, trying to restore the original peace where people were living in harmony whether they are the wrongdoers or they are the victims. Uh, and the restorative justice uh, really goes with the, uh, with the teaching that we, we hate the injustice, but we love the person. And that is uh, something that is very important. And we, as Nyamwa said this afternoon, I was teaching on uh, Non, uh, active non-violence. Again, it has got the same idea that you, you cannot continue the cycle of violence. You must have other ways that you can stop the cycle of violence. And that is what we normally call the active non-violence where we want to see the goodness of humanity and let people live together. The issue of conflict transformation uh, is very crucial uh, because it leads uh, to good relationship on people on parties that are in conflict or in dispute, uh, taking into consideration that these people live together. It also uh, reflects the idea that we as Africans, uh, we are very relational people. We uh, our, our life is communal, unlike the Western model where individualism uh, takes the center stage. Uh, Africans tend to, uh, to, to be inclusive and they do, not, they do not want somebody to be entirely excluded from them. And so this uh, restorative justice uh, has its apex in conflict uh, transformation. But it starts with the issues like uh, uh, conflict resolution uh, or issues like uh, conflict management. And of course, what we have been hearing this afternoon, uh, uh, mediation. All, all these uh, methods of, uh, of uh, uh, restorative justice, where the aim is to tell people that people have to live together. People, they still need each other. And when somebody has done something wrong, that person can be reconciled. So the perpetrator of the injustice 
may may also be a, a victim of uh, a wrong system or the, or the society. And so uh, here we want to say that uh, the the person who commits crime or somebody who uh, tries to do uh, to to steal from somebody all in civil cases, uh, taking somebody's property. Uh, still, the, we, we would like to reach a point where uh, both the complainant and the, the defendant can leave the court uh, as friends. Uh, this is what normally what we normally call a win-win paradigm. Uh, this is a very important uh, situation because uh, people don't travel very far. They, they still see each other, they still meet at funerals, they'll see meet at weddings, in church service, and uh, they may feel estranged in their own uh, country or communities if, they, um, if there was no uh, solution was found where they can reconcile. And, and that's why I liked what uh, uh, Honorable Moses Vangela was trying to tell us, that our courts have now gone uh, to an extra step, of course, we of uh, uh, making mediation as part and parcel of justice. And this mediation is part of the restorative justice. There is also the small courts where people can go and uh, have small disputes. And that is also there. So we, as a country, I think we are, are going uh, very far. And this also shows that we, we need that the judiciary uh, uh, can trust other people to, to bring about settlement. And these settlements uh, make people uh, feel happy and feel uh, uh, be, uh, belonging to the society. So, the, so, this, so this is really a role of the judiciary that they uh, that a magistrate must be able to, or a judge, to look at the situation and say this case really needs to go to mediation because uh, instead of us staying here three, four years waiting for a better solution. And then, so when the case is brought to the, to the mediators or the mediation process, and that's where now we, we come and tell the mediators, they too must go to the, to the best possible solutions. And that is conflict uh, transformation. Where the conflict are, are transformed, this uh, means that uh, uh, we, is, uh, uh, that the, this uh, conflict transformation is a process of uh, engaging with and transforming relationships, interests, and discourses. And this eventually leads to uh, peace building. Or while it may not be possible for every mediation to go to that stage, uh, at the back of the mind, the mediator should be able to, to see, to grab, uh, grab any opportunity to bring about this because at the end of the day, all the parties will be transformed. So uh, what is the end product uh, of this uh, uh, conflict transformation? We say it is uh, a healed society because there's healing when people come together and they had a dispute in court, then they do the mediation, and then it goes now to this COVID transformation. This is also restorative of the human dignity. Many of the uh, adjudications uh, uh, that we, we have or litigations, they normally lead to some sort of indignity. Somebody feels uh, I was not heard properly or my case was not really heard. And uh, this can bring a lot of uh, ill feeling. In conflict transformation, the mediator uh, tries to bring about, uh, are there some goals that were not 
really addressed by all these parties? Or were there people who were excluded in this dispute, in this uh, litigation, if it was, it was a litigation of some kind? And you, you, you'll be surprised to see that uh, in conflict transformation, you look, uh, you, you try to probe a bit more to be more inclusive and to make sure that, that uh, other people are brought into who are crucial to the dispute or the conflict into the fore. Also to bring about, were there other things, uh, what normally in Kenya we say, hidden agendas. Because hidden agendas can be very detrimental to, to settlements. So lastly, uh, conflict transformation, again, uh, it goes beyond settlement. Uh, yeah, like uh, you, you have that, you have that. We would like that the people can shake hands. You know, this we're talking about a uh, handshake. Uh, and we, we would like that this handshake that can make the make people live together in harmony. And this is what the judiciary should look, be looking at. Uh, our, our, our societies are so divided. In Africa, I, can, I don't know which country I've not visited, that you find that the, the current justice system, uh, which is borrowed from the West, does not really work. In the Rwanda, they tried it and they went to Gachacha system. Although Gachacha uh, came, uh, somehow lost its path, it went from, uh, from restorative justice, it became retributive, uh, and that was not the, the real African way. Although it was still a better way of trying to reconcile the communities. So uh, I think uh, we as mediators, we would like to appreciate the judiciary for thinking about the persons who come before it and it's knowing that there must be a better way. And, and the idea is not more of, um, uh, paying lawyers more money or the judges uh, dragging the cases, but it's actually building our societies. And with this kind of uh, a conflict transformation, we can make better societies. We can, uh, Africa can improve and Africa can actually, uh, people can start uh, having trust in the system and uh, be more productive. But when we have the current state we have at the moment, people live in fear and, uh, and the people build big houses in rural areas, but they can't live in them because they're afraid that people will come and attack them. So people don't enjoy their whatever they have intended to because the justice system does not bring reconciliation. So thank you very much. I, I think I was only given five minutes and I think, uh, I hope this will contribute to the current talk. Thank you so much, Reverend Professor Peter Gishure. Um, yes, that was very illuminating. Uh, it has definitely contributed to the conversation that we are having. Um, at this juncture to move things along, we will usher in the comment, the question and answer session. Uh, this is where we now uh, come in and uh, engage Honorable Wanjala as much as possible to get all the clarification that we can in, on any queries that we may have and uh, to get a clearer perspective on the rules. To kick start, I will, some of the, some questions have been coming in, streaming in as we proceed. So I will kick start with um, some of the issues that I have, that have been raised. Uh, and then we can uh, proceed from there. So Honorable Lonjala, uh, a question, one of the questions that has been raised is on uh, uh, virtual media, uh, virtual mediation. And as we can see, you've taken us through the rules. Um, uh, that the rules have provided for it. Um, we, you, you also mentioned, you also acknowledge the fact that, uh, that, that its role, technology and virtual mediation in general has been augmented in uh, the post-pandemic world because of the shift that is happening with online transactions and trans online interactions and transactions. So um, this question is basically to ask, uh, what is the vision uh, for the Kenyan landscape because when you compare with what is happening uh, in other courts, courts in other jurisdictions, um, 
tools such as video conferencing, emails, virtual meetings in chat rooms, teleconferencing, uh, ability to upload uh, written claims, um, written submissions to the cloud. These are some of the tools that are being employed by courts in other jurisdictions. So as the rules uh, provide for virtual mediation in Kenya, what is the vision for, for that, for the judiciary and for that within the rules for the Kenyan landscape? Honorable Lonjala. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, virtual mediations and generally um, conducting of uh, proceedings online, filing of uh, documents, exchange of documents, doing a hearing virtually, and uh, and and being able to being able to to to, to cross examine somebody or to share a document with them. And, and, and so on. Of course, it comes with its own challenges. I know even for the established, uh, developed economies, they have really done a lot, but I know they still, there are some challenges that they, 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 they still go through. Yes, in the judiciary, uh, this, the COVID-19, I can say it, it got us off guard, but um, it has really pushed us to do some things. I think for the past one year, we have done so much digitally uh, in the in the digital direction that we had done we had done for so many years uh, post independence, because right now we we are now even here at uh, at FICA we are now registering cases online, including the the criminal cases, the the the, the charge sheets are scanned at the police station, forwarded to court via email they are printed, then the, a, a case has to be registered digitally. Um, if you if the, the the number the case number is generated digitally so you can't be you, you are not allowed to open a file manually if if the system is low you have to wait until it is up so that uh, the file can be registered there is a system we call the case tracking system the cts so if the case is registered uh, online it will automatically be uploaded at the cts which will uh, which will then uh, track the case all the way the life of the case up to the end now um if you if, if, if for example the case was in court today it is given a mention next week the cts will automatically key it that date in the system and for you to for you to it, it, it generates the cost list for you depending on how the, uh, the returns from court were keyed in. So if your clerk does not key in in the, in the CTS, you, that case will not appear on the cost list for next week. So you can't uh, manually do a cost list for, 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 for any matter right now. So even though it appears as if it, it, sometimes we have downtown in terms of uh, internet, sometimes the electricity and so on. But I, 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 my feel is that this is, this is this is this is a train that has left the station and we are not going back. Uh, part of the challenges we are we are getting we run into right now, I have said, is uh, internet. Sometimes it's very low, but we coping with it because uh, even for pleas, even for for, for mentions, now the, the the accused persons connect with us from the police station. They are not transported to court. Um, the same applies to mediation. We are looking at a situation where you should be able to conduct, to, a, a matter can be filed virtually. You just log in the judiciary portal, you upload the documents. It is screened and it is communicated to you by email. You are able to communicate with the, with the parties virtually. You are able to do the mediation virtually, have a settlement agreement, of course, the, the nitty gritties of how it should be signed and then forwarded back and so on, and then have it forwarded to court and adopted without vi ever visiting the court premises. So right now, when you file a matter, it is assessed, it's communicated back to you on email, you pay via M-Pesa, send the confirmation to the court, a receipt is generated, then scanned back to you. So we are looking at a time when 
everything can be able to do, we are, we are able to do everything uh, uh, virtually. And I, I know that is still a long way to go because of the, 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 the challenges I have talked about. And sometimes some, some parties are many and they have no internet connectivity, especially for succession matters. Some are too old. You tell them to log in on the judiciary. Uh, we use Microsoft Teams. You will not, you, you, you will not see them. So some of them, for they, 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 they come to port physically because they don't understand how they can log in uh, and, and, and participate in the proceedings virtually. So those are challenges because even for the for, from the judiciary's end, as much as we put structures in place in terms of the computers, in terms of internet, in terms of reliable power supply, in terms of uh, training of the staff, but what about the advocates? What about the parties from the other end? What about those parties who are unrepresented? Like today, if my course list comes out, it has a link. You just click on the link and you are able to join in my, in my proceedings. Those links are shared. You, you get the course list on the, judicial, on, the, on the Kenya law website. What if you are a party who, is, who has no access to that? How will you know and how will you join in those proceedings? So the challenge is not just basically on the side of the judiciary but the capacity building on the side of the parties so that they can also be able to participate in the, in the proceedings, whether it's a mediation or whether it is a court hearing. But yes, that is, uh, that is, that is, that's where we are going and I don't think there is going back on it. So you have to, whatever rules we make, it has to take into account the fact that that's the direction that you are going. And that's why we have tried to have some bits of that in our rules. We left the issue of uh, guidelines open because that keeps on changing. Because even for the for the for the for the for the digital processes that uh, for the digital proceedings that are being conducted right now, they are only being guided by practice directions, which may be changed in a day, because you don't cast it in stone uh, in a more rigid document that will require to be amended tomorrow. So even as we improve. We, we, we are trying to now bring in the legal framework that we should be able to now address the challenges of our digitization and digital proceedings. Okay, um, uh, thank you for that. And just um, uh, another comment is coming in and it's uh, more of a query in terms of an electronic system to having an electronic system where we can uh, deposit private agreements, you know, just so encompassing, including also the element of private agreements. Uh, would this be something that would be considered as efficient? Uh, is it something that it would be, would be considered to be adopted? Having an electronic system to, be, to adopt private agreements. Um, for, 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 for adoption, because they are the files are placed if 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 it is um for filing if you are to present the the, the, the affidavit with the settled private settlement agreement you can file it digitally the same way we we, we file uh, we file a, a, a case or a, a plaint so um probably that can be in the guidelines but i think it we can also mention it in the rules that the affidavit can be filed electronically. So in fact, in the definition section, there is a place where I said that um, filing includes physical filing or uploading of documents on the judiciary portal. So you can, it, it, it covers that. You, you just uh, um, generate, you, you, you scan the affidavit, you email it to court, you, it will be assessed and communicated to you. And then after that, you pay and forward the evidence of payment to court. Then a receipt will be generated. So yes, uh, you can you can you can file it digitally. And then the register that I talked about, it it it, it, it may be electronic. It may be a physical register. So I, I think we, we for the for, for for the settlement agreements, we may have to maintain both an electronic and a digital register. Although even in court right now, if you email the document to us, we still print it out and place it in a, in a physical file, um, but it will have been filed electronically. 
so that we, ja we also have a physical file so that if something happens to the electronic uh, register, then you, you have a physical file. Thank you for that uh, a comment. Um, I would like to call upon um, Megita Sam for any just to, uh, any queries that and comments that you may have. Um, thank you, Megita Emerald. Um, before I go on. Um, I'd really like to commend the Judiciary, the MAC Committee, the Rules Committee, and other stakeholders for a job well done in coming up with these rules, um, because I think they are quite comprehensive. They've dealt with a lot of um, gray areas that, um, other, that before the, 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 the rules um, were, were quite the, the were they were open the, the, the worry dealt with even in the in the court guidelines for instance the issue about private settlements i know this because um sometime a few months back i had i had a mediation it was a private mediation and when i was trying to find out the procedure for filing the settlement in court um i noticed that uh I got different answers as to how to go about it. So I'm very glad that the rules for um, have dealt with that, for instance. Um, I also appreciated that the rules made a clear distinction between qualified mediators and accredited mediators, because um, then again, not everyone, not all mediators are going to be practicing under the umbrella of the judiciary. So it is a good thing that the rules also try to um, regulate that portion of the profession. Um, in terms, uh, but then I have uh, three concerns. Um, the first one being uh, when I was reading the definition of um, a mediator in the mediation bill and in the rules, the mediation bill 2020 and in the rules, and also the proposed ADR bill 2020, there was a different definition. There, there, there was a different definition. For instance, the ADR bill 2020 uh, defines a mediator as a person who's um, accredited by the Nairobi Center of International Arbitration. Whereas the mediation bill um, talks about a person who is accredited by any of the institutions it recognizes. So um, I think there's a bit of uh, confusion there. And I think that the rules also need to be harmonized with the rest of the bills that are, are proposed um, in parliament. And then further, I wanted to find out, or rather to clarify, um, does this mean that MAC is the repository and main registrar of like mediators, list of mediators and um, accredited mediators, or is it the NCIA? I, I think there's, there's need for clarification there so that we know um, even for the mediator, qualified mediators who are not caught, caught annexed mediators, where do they answer to? Um, which body do they answer to? Is it still the, is it still MAC or do they answer to a separate body altogether? Then my second question um, revolves around uh, screening of cases. Um, there was a mention, one of the factors that was mentioned under that rule is that uh, the financial the financial um, value of the subject matter. So my question becomes, will there be a financial threshold for which matters get referred to mediation? For instance, matters have a certain financial threshold can't be mediated or um, specifically have to go to the courts. That would be my second question. My third question is on the private mediation agreement under Rule 39J, where it says that uh, the, the, the settlement agreement has to deal with all the issues. Um, to me, that implies that partial private settlement agreements 
cannot therefore be enforced by the court. Is that correct? Or could you kindly clarify that, Honorable Anjala? Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you. Uh, Thank you. There, 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 are, there are quite a number of questions on the chat. Also, you, 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 you time allows, you can still touch on them. Now, um, these rules are being made pursuant to the existing law, and as of today, the existing law is the regime found under Section Fifty Nine of the Civil Procedure Act, which was amended in twenty twelve. The first draft was in fact made in 2019. Uh, the second draft, the Naivasha draft is 2020. We don't make rules in anticipation of our, our law that is not yet been passed. If you remember, even the ADR bill, when it was, uh, it, came, it was published the first time, it has totally changed. It was published, it went for public participation. At some point it was frozen. And uh, right now it has been published again. It has, it's supposed to go through public participation and, and, and people need to give their views. Probably it will drastically change again. Um, the, the, the bill has not yet been passed. It can fail. It can go on the floor of the house and it is shot down. It might be passed and the president refuses to assent to it. So we, 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 with these rules as made, were not made, uh, they cannot be made in line with a, with a, with a bill that has not yet been, uh, become law. So the first option is to either wait and do nothing until the bill is passed, whatever time it will be passed, or to work with the law that is in existence at that time. And if the law is changed or if a bill, because like you realize there is another bill before the National Assembly, the yes, the National Assembly, uh, the mediation bill, we don't know which one will be passed. And we don't know whether one will be compromised for the other or both of them will be passed. So you can't really, you can't really make rules in anticipation of a bill that is still being discussed in parliament. So you have to wait, probably the one, the one that will be passed and it will, there will be need for amending the rules or for coming up with fresh rules, then that will have to be done. Uh, we are almost entering into an election period and probably people will be concerned with other things. So you, you, you don't know, you, you, probably the parliament might come back to give uh, concern to the, to the bill, maybe after the elections, you don't know. So the, that, that's why we cannot, we can, it's not that it is, it is uh, in variance with the proposed bill. It's just that it is not made pursuant to that bill because that bill is not yet law. Um, the, whether the judiciary is going to be a repository of all mediators, and I think someone has commented whether it will be legal to practice unless it's the judiciary that has accredited you. Now, um, if you look at, the, for example, the bill, the ADR bill, I can just briefly talk about it. It doesn't, it, 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 uh, it tries as much as possible to leave out what court is doing. It gives powers to the NCIA to accredit mediators nationally, but it leaves out what court is doing to a large extent. And that's why there is the, the, the mediation accreditation committee is still retained within that bill. It has not been done away with. And that the, the, the function, the mandate of the mandate of that committee is still as it is in the act right now to accredit mediators. So my understanding, and I know probably the people will still comment about it, is that NCIA will accredit mediators for practice generally within the country. But if you are to become, to practice as a mediator in court, you will have to be accredited by MAP. And practice in court is in two ways. 
One, you are accredited by Mark to practice under the quota and mediation program, or you do a mediation privately outside there, but you would want that settlement agreement to be recognized and enforced by the court. Now, if you have to bring a document in court you are calling a settlement agreement, uh, the court needs to know who you are. The court needs to know whether you, uh, you, 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 you did a correct, the, the, the right thing. And the far it can go is to require of you to either be accredited by Mark as an accredited mediator or be accredited by an institution that Mark knows that this institution does uh, its work well. For example, if I can just give by way of example, if Mark, for example, comes as, as a, up with a list and says, those people who are accredited by NCIA, those people who are accredited by the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators as mediators, we recognize them as qualified mediators. So that when you are, when, when, and you know, with, 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 with these things, you know, you know, in court, several things can happen. Someone can show up with a settlement agreement that never occurred, in fact. You can't just assume that every person that is, represents himself as a mediator is a, is a professional. And that's why we even have our disciplinary issues with these mediators right now. I've had situations where a mediator just did things you can't even imagine. Now, if you, if you are to say that you will allow that settlement agreement to come to court, form part of the court record and enforce, this, enforce it as an order of the court, and yet you don't know the person who generated it, then that will be the challenge. So it's not that judiciary is the repository of all the mediators practicing in this country, but it is the repository of the mediators participating in the court and next mediation program. Um, you can see there is a comment on, uh, on, on, on okay, you, the, your other question is the financial threshold for referral of matters to mediation. Now that rule, it doesn't, that, that, that those, those are just notes. It's not saying that you have to graduate, you have to have um, like, a, like a schedule. If, you are, if, if the subject matter fall, if the value of the subject matter is this amount, then uh, it will be referred to mediation or not. In fact, it is, those are suggestive notes that if I take a file, I place it before me and I start screening it for suitability for referral to mediation. What are the things that should immediately come, uh, come on my mind? What should I look, look at? So should I look at the age of the matter, for example? Should I look at the agenda of the parties, for example? Should I look at how much is at stake in this mediation, in this, in this file? So what is the value of the subject matter? Should I look at the issues involved? Are they public interest issues or not? So that that informs your decision. At the end of it all, I'll say, this one should go to mediation because I have taken into consideration A, B, C, D, and I found that it is okay. So we will not be fixing any threshold, but we are just suggesting things that the court may consider, the screening officer can consider uh, before deciding to refer a matter to mediation. Um, a, a partial private settlement agreement? Yes, the answer is yes. And this, we debated it very uh, so much in Naivasha, uh, but I can, I'm happy to, to hear your comments on it because um, here are parties who have a dispute and they, 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 they the dispute involved, involves three issues. So they sit together they agree on two of the issues. They agree that uh, this house will be taken by so-and-so, the plot at this place will be taken at, by so-and-so. Then they record a settlement agreement, they sign a settlement agreement. But they are not able to agree on the third issue. So on one hand, you, you, the, the, the settlement agreement comes to court, it is registered, it is serialized, it's given a number, probably a party wishes to execute it, it goes before a, a, a judicial officer who adopts it and a decree is issued for his enforcement, for his execution. Then on, this, on the other hand, 
the same parties, one of the parties, files a case in court on the third issue. So there is now another court case going on in respect of the same issue involving the same subject matter probably and involving the same parties. Two cases in court. One of them filed as a case, one of them found itself in court by way of a settlement agreement. That's what members thought it might bring a lot of issues and confusion because when you are hearing the matter as a judicial officer, how, what much weight do you give to the settlement agreement? So the, the, the agreement was, if parties have resolved the matter completely and they have a full settlement agreement, it's easy, you, 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 there will be no other case in court. But if you know, you know, you know, even in the in the ADR bill, I think it has been proposed that you will need a certificate to show that you you tried mediation. So if you, on one hand, you have a settlement agreement, there's a decree you are executing, and on the other hand, there is a pending court case that still people are coming to court to testify, then it might bring some logistical and um, and, um some judicial issues in terms of how the case will be disposed of. So you either agree on all the issues or you file a case in court. At least if it's under the court annex mediation program, it's easier to, to monitor those things. But uh, if it was done outside the court, because at that time when you are filing the settlement agreement, we really don't know what went on outside there. So the, the, the members felt that it will be difficult to separate the two. Um, I think someone was asked why 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 file by way of affidavit. I think the rules have said uh, that uh, an, a mediator should file. Uh, you should swear an affidavit indicating where the mediation was conducted. You, you are confirming to us that it was done professionally. You are confirming that you saw the party sign. If you if you just show up with a settlement agreement alone, how will we know? where the mediation was conducted. You know, an affidavit is a legal document that uh, the mediator is binding himself that he oversaw this process. You know, you're trying to just, to, to, to get someone to own up what he did with the document because we, we didn't know what happened before you came to court. So you just show up with a settlement agreement. The following day, someone says, that's not my signature. I never signed that document. I've never seen it. Then as a court, we have, we have adopted and formed part of our record. At least someone should own up the process. And it's not that we are just trying to bring in some form of um, clarity that someone can be able to own up the process and how it happened by way of affidavit so that we believe your document. But if you just say our agreements show up in court and they are adopted and they form a, a judgment of the court, then that is where you run into trouble because you will get a document, you don't know who did it, how it was done, where it was done, and someone disowns it. So that's the reason. And an affidavit is only 50, 75 shillings. I don't think it is something that is now uh, occasioning further costs to the, to the parties. Uh, there, is a, there, there was someone who was asking as to uh, uh, why the language of the court. The language of the court is not, um, it's not like it's a technical legal language. It is English and Kiswahili. That's what I meant, the language of the court. I think there is, uh, there is somewhere where it says that proceedings of the court shall be done either in English or Kiswahili. So those are the official languages of the court. So that you don't show up with an agreement that is uh, drafted in, 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 in a language that the court does not understand, then you now need an interpreter. Then the interpretation might change what is contained in that. So at least let it be something that can be read by the court without the need for translation. Uh, I think there is a comment someone is talking about uh, why have advocates, they, we still, we, we still making the, court, the work for advocates and we're making it expensive. The rules are clear that you can be represented by an advocate or a representative of your choice. And that representative is allowed to attend in the mediation. So I think, the, I don't know which rule is it, but it's very clear that you may appear at the mediation in person or with an advocate or with a representative of your choice. So we are not, we are not limiting you. We are not, we, are not, we are not directing you to hire the services of an advocate. 
you can come with your father as your representative to help you in the mediation. I think let me answer those ones first and uh, hand it back to you so that we, we, we move on in a structured manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Angela. This is uh, Wangari Kabiru, and I thank the colleagues as uh, we still carry on with the conversations. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mediator Emerald, for taking us through the first part of uh, the discussions. Uh, it would be good if we get into alignment at this time, uh, because yes, we have several questions, and uh, already I know that uh, uh, we, uh, where we are, on Rabuanjala, you need to take some water because yes, you have been uh, speaking uh, to us uh, for quite some time. Um, so it would be good for us to give ourselves um, uh, a time check, which is now uh, 6.30 p.m. Uh, on Rabuanjala. Do we have 30 minutes, an additional 30 minutes, or how much more time do we have? Because we have uh, quite a number of questions which need to be tackled, some straightforward, some we need to go round and round, which some of them you responded to. Kindly, on Rabuanjala. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. I'm, 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 I'm available. Okay, great. So, uh, uh, yes, so Sam and myself will still carry on with you. And also, I thank uh, uh, Professor uh, Peter Gishure, Reverend of the Catholic University, for his um, introduction and just taking us through conflict transformation and uh, the role of the judiciary in conflict transformation. We do hope that that uh, mini lecture from uh, Professor Gishure on conflict transformation and the judiciary also helps to realign our minds with, uh, even as we look at these rules. So uh, I thank you for uh, also touching on some of the questions that ha um, have been posted in the chat, Honorable Angela. And uh, uh, we, yes, we had advanced questions, um, uh, starting with um, the, what, you, the, uh, in, what you've gone through, whether the proposed Naivasha rules are designed to make the judiciary the central organization for mediation in Kenya. And uh, uh, this, that, that question having come uh, from the mediators, and uh, uh, just to mention that uh, we hosted uh, two sessions, uh, starting from uh, 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 when we received the, the, these rules um, in January. We hosted an open session with the community, and then we also hosted one other session with mediation service centers. And so that's where some of these questions have been generated uh, from, or areas that require clarification. And then also we have this open um, session uh, with, with colleagues. So um, again, you've uh, but, uh, aimed to tackle the area of whether it's illegal to practice without being on the list of the judiciary. I think there's still a great area around that. Uh, we may not necessarily speak into it right now because it also ties in with the next one, which relates to uh, that uh, we have now that we have the judiciary mediation rules or we have the judiciary. <laughs> sorry, <clears throat> sorry, Mediator Wangari, you're muted. Sorry, Sam, you can hear me now? I think I'm clear now. Yes, it had dropped off, sorry about that. Um, um, so, uh, and, and this is probably more to the mediator community uh, with regards to the context that, uh, yes, the Attorney General has, uh, the, has a, um, an ADR policy committee, the Senate has come up with a new version of the ADR policy, Parliament, at Parliament, they're sitting a uh, mediation bill and so the first time. So uh, the, 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 actually the question came in is where are they clashing? Um, it appears that there's a contest uh, and there's co uh, competing and perhaps this is bringing confusion to mediators, but most of all, it's ultimately not making mediation not to work well in Kenya. So I think that that's probably a comment that just brings, uh, the, there's an opportunity for, harm, for harmonizing this work that is happening um, in, in, with different people. Um, the next question, and uh, uh, I know you've uh, a bit tied to it, uh, touched on it. Uh, it. It comes from the context of, uh, uh, that uh, the current draft does not help Kenyans in achieving the goal to be self-determined and to access justice without the hurdles that the court system carries with it. It has been designed to make work for lawyers and law firms with two main examples. Um, A, so there are several examples on it. A, at mediation, disputants should represent themselves by saying that a lawyer, a law firm, or even pupils, or even a substitute lawyer may be the one attending. This is the mischief of the court systems across the world. We shall fail if this is what is part of the court annex system for Kenyans. So that is a comment that has come um, tied to that. Um, uh, then the continuation of that, uh, because they are very related, is that uh, uh, on the context that the current draft does not help Kenyans um, based on um, some areas. Uh, on private mediation, 
uh, uh, what you just spoke into the, um, just at the end. It says that uh, there is no reason why uh, the private mediation or, or the private mediation agreement should not be deposited directly by the mediator, the firm, or the disputant with the court without the mediator taking an affidavit. So I think this speaks into now the last part of probably the way you are closing your remarks. So it says that the mediator is a qualified professional and the settlement agreement should not require to be overwritten by another intermediary before acceptance by the court. This is increasing the cost in terms of time and money in the path of resolving conflicts for Kenyans. Um, I know probably you said that yes, depositing it is 75 shillings or an affidavit someone can get it for uh, different uh, costs, but I think the, yeah, that is worth for the uh, rules committee to consider because one more shilling in the system then we beat the purpose of that mediation enables people to be able to get resolution at much lower costs and even more efficiently so tied to this is a recommendation uh, that review the systems at the judiciary if that is what is required uh, to and and uh, not make any possible future efficient mediation system to fit in the old systems or whatever laws required to be reviewed even if it shall take some time. Uh, the committee proposal is to make, okay, yeah, it goes back, the committee proposal is to make work for lawyers and make mediation expensive in terms of fees and time. Um, secondly, and most importantly, uh, the requirement for an affidavit by the mediator undermines the profession of mediation and invalidates the mediator as the authority in their own profession, uh, which is mediation. Uh, Honorable Angela, kindly, just on the, the ones that uh, we've, we've gone through, uh, they were on the chat already, the, the, the next one tied to this was the one that uh, you spoke about at the very beginning uh, with Mediator Emerald, uh, because it, it, it says, can an electronic system be used to deposit private agreements that are handled to court? This is efficient, and um, especially in the digital age. So kindly, could you just speak into that uh, uh, area of what I've commented about? Thank you, Honorable Angela. Thank you. Um... Although I have, uh, I, have, uh, I have already talked about some of the things. Now, on the issue of uh, representation, I have clarified that uh, the, 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 the party can be represented by an advocate or the party can, uh, can be represented by uh, a person of their choice who is not necessarily an advocate. Uh, when we started, it was a bit, uh, we, we, we debated on whether advocates should take part in the mediation. And I think um, it, it, for, for them to have a buy-in, it was, uh, they even argued that it is a constitutional right for someone to be represented in any proceeding. So uh, we, we, we reached a, a point where if a person is uh, if a, an advocate, but um, you can actually be represented by a person or don't have to hire an advocate uh, to represent you. Now, um, on the other issue, the affidavit, I've also talked to you, to it, it, this is a, a settlement agreement to court to form part of the court record it will be adopted as a judgment of the court if uh, someone wishes to enforce it a decree will issue and that decree will be uh, executed like any other decree of the court for those of you who don't know how, how execution takes place uh, that's the time where the rubber meets the road because Someone can be committed to civil jail if they fail to pay some money. Someone can parcel of land, or someone's vehicle can be attached and sold by an auctioneer. So if all those things are going to happen, based on a settlement agreement that the person who oversaw the process does not want to, 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 to commit himself to that process, then it will be tricky. What I can assure you is that you can't just show up with a, a, a settlement agreement as it is alone in court and tell us that, you know, we did this, it has been signed. I want you to take it. I want it to form part of your record and I want a decree to issue. 
on that. It, it, the court cannot allow that. So to uh, to re we can't oversee what you are doing before you came to court. You have not filed any case with us, but you want us to recognize what you did. At least swear an affidavit telling us what you did and where you did so that you can own up that. You can tell us that the parties referred this dispute to me on 5th of May. I met them um, at Tika in a particular, uh, at Tika where the mediation was conducted. The parties were able to agree on issues and they signed voluntarily and so on. And the settlement agreement that is attached to this affidavit is what was the outcome of the mediation. I saw them sign and so on. So that the court can have some form of security and comfort in adopting your settlement agreement and uh, issuing a decree based on that settlement agreement alone. And in never my signature. I never signed that document. I never attended any mediation. I was never in Tika on that day. To problems because probably we may have issued adverse orders based on that settlement agreement. We may even have issued uh, uh, eviction orders. Someone's vehicle may have been attacked. Someone is showing up to tell us that that process never took place at all. I know there is a comment that says that mediators are, are professional people. Really, it, it, taking that form of trust is it, it may land the court into trouble. So for us to, to, to accept that document, we will need to oversaw the process. And that commitment uh, is in the process of, uh, is in the form of an affidavit. If, affidavit is uh, if you if you swear a false affidavit under the provisions of the law, you 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 run into trouble. So we want we want some we wanted some comfort, and that comfort is why we said it should be, because uh, on in in other situations we will have said that you file a miscellaneous application, or you file another kind of uh, process which will essentially be very costly. An application, some applications are 500 shillings, some applications are, are, are 1,500 shillings. The affidavit way is the most cost-effective way of doing that. And you know, you would want to do something that uh, will be acceptable across the country so that uh, uh, we, uh, we don't issue orders that may land us into trouble tomorrow. Um, uh, there are other, there are other other um, stakeholders, and that's why we have shared this this uh, draft rules extensive so that they can they can give their their, their views. You know, you, you, the, the 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 AG ADR policy committee or the the ADR the Senate ADR policy is um. If it is a stakeholder, they are entitled to give their to, to give their views in this document to enrich it. But you see, you can't you can't do it in accordance to how they they they, they work. They probably they were established to do uh, their own work. But you share the document with them. They give you their views. You have an interaction with them, and you 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 include their comments within the document that you are saying you are you are, you are, you are working on. The mediation bill in parliament and the ADR bill in Senate. Uh, once the law will be passed, once it will be passed, if it is the ADR bill or the mediation bill or both of them or none of them, then the law, then the rules will be changed. But for now, these rules are being crafted based on the existing law. They, what is in the bill? But like I told you, the other option is to wait until those, the, the, those bills are passed. Um, and you know what that means. So the, the, we, can't, we can't make rules in anticipation because probably even the power to make those rules will be placed in a different body. So you can't make, um, you can't make rules based on a bill that is still uh, going through uh, a process. Um, whether they, 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 they are competing or they are clashing, 
No, not because um, rules rules only establish procedure. An act of parliament is the law. And uh, what the act provides, the rules are meant to, 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 to give effect to what the act provides. Because if, it's, if the rules contradict what the law has provided, then the rules being inferior to the law, they will be null and void. So um, I think that's what I can say on that point. Um, I can see there's a comment on payment of mediators. I'm not understanding whether it's saying that uh, it should be. Because it's let me, yeah. Yeah. yeah, let me let me, yeah let, let me let me walk us through that the next that next part. And I, I thank you for those comments. Um, I think mm -hmm. one of the things that we have today is that yes, we are uh, receiving your comments, and colleagues can still be able to uh, send uh, or yeah send out their. Uh, written memoranda responses and uh, even as uh, you've openly uh, given us your responses and your views so as we've posted the, the questions that came in so the the question that you are alluding to is the one that says okay it's, it's one of the advanced questions this seven um the issue of payment of mediation mediators based on reaching an agreement uh in other words being paid in full uh or to be penalized if they don't uh, this becomes a negative incentive system it may be a reflection of a deeper issue, which requires the root cause to be dealt with. Is this problem arising due to the due to the judiciary system of recruiting anyone to be a mediator, not those who see this as a duty to society? So, uh, there, yes, it's the, the, the there is a, as you are reading through there is the part that uh, you mentioned that uh, sometimes probably some mediators uh, could be uh, just sending in non-compliance. So. The, the, this question uh, actually uh, uh, brings to the context whether the persons who are being recruited or enrolled to become mediators actually have this work to the heart of it, or it's because there's an opportunity to um, uh, get remuneration or an opportunity to be attached to the judiciary or just other incentives, which perhaps may not be, um, just as it ended at the end, a duty to society. Honorable Angela? Yeah, so the, the issue of payment, um... Payment quite some time. The first time, even before the commencement of the pilot program, there was a workshop. I think it was at Safari Park, where it was again discussed extensively, and there were proponents who wanted to give the, the mid the amount. There were those uh, ones who. Were on, yes. on we, we seem to be losing you uh, after a few words. Uh, so mm -hmm. probably if you can perhaps get off your internet and get back onto it, we seem to be losing you one word just after every other word. So in, in uh, the meantime, uh, I don't know. Is it um, is it continuing? Uh, now, uh, now it's now it's great. Yes, we hear you very well. Kindly, yes, you were speaking, and uh, it was on the uh, on the query with regard to the. The proposal to 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 pay in uh, in proratas or in, in in portions, depending on whether an agreement is reached or not, to the mediators, and the question of whether it's about the, an issue of the recruitment system at the judiciary, of getting people who can are ready to serve Kenyans. Kindly, Honourable Angela. Oh, okay. So um, the, the 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 it was a heated uh, debate, and uh, I think there are people who are saying that if you pay. A, a, a bigger sum, you may not maintain the process in the long run. And there are those who are saying that if you pay little or less, then you will not retain the, the, the best of the mediators that you have. Uh, and so the figure that you pay now was reached after a stakeholder consultation. It was also difficult for you to, for us to ascertain whether it should be a scale so that uh, on this kind of matter, you are paid this, on this kind of matter, you are paid this. If you give us a full settlement, you are paid this. If you don't give us a settlement, you are paid this. So we decided we will pay 20,000 as a flat rate because we didn't have the structures in place to have a graduated uh, a table of, 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 uh, for payment. Now, uh, the experience has shown that that is not uh, a given a matter that uh, takes you 20 sessions and it has uh, five lawyers, it has 15 parties, you have seat 
session, 20 sessions or so before you reach a settlement. And if you are given a matter where someone just calls the parties, they tell him we are not interested in the mediation and he files as non-settlement, uh, a non-compliance uh, report the same day, he, he is paid the So uh, is it a fair system? That's why the rule for payment to be to be made and uh, increasingly also you know for every program there is audit and sometimes people may audit and raise audit queries and ask the and ask you are we getting value for money if uh, you screen a matter today you refer it to a mediator he calls the parties tomorrow interested he files a report the same day, and the following day he is paid uh, twenty thousand shillings. Uh, eventually, you have one thousand matters referred to mediation, out of which of non-compliance, and they were all paid. Then you will be asked, "Is it value for money? Is it sustaining?" Because if it goes back to time, and um, uh, unfortunately some mediators are doing that so it the, 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 the reasoning is that proceeds whether there is a settlement or non-settlement you are entitled to to being paid you do, you are not obligated as a mediator to give to bring to us a settlement agreement you can take but it's failed to agree so we are not compelling you to bring to us a settlement agreement. So you can file a non-settlement or a settlement. That is okay. You will be paid the full amount. But if it's a non-compliance, that's where now the prorated payment. Did you do anything or do you just called and filed a, a non-settlement? Is it, is it the file is reallocated to another mediator? And probably that other mediator does the work and they end up even giving us a, a settlement agreement. So how, how entitled are you to that payment compared to that other mediator? So if, you, if, if, you are, if what you are giving to us is a non-compliance, then we would want to know what is your effort in that. And if there is a effort, you can clearly see you'll get the full payment. But if all you did was a mere call, then you may be entitled to either something small or none at all. That is what is a, that's what that rule means. And you agree with me that it has it, it is very essential to address uh, some wayward mediators who are who are, who are really doing um, tarnishing the names of those good mediators by just showing up. I, I, I always give an example of a case where a mediator showed up. And uh, I think one of the, no, no, there was no party in attendance, but one of the advocates was his friend. So they sat, they chatted, uh, they, 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 had a, they had a good time, probably for 10 or 15 minutes. Then he went, he went straight to the registry to claim, to, to ask for claim forms for payment. So how, how, how is that? How are you entitled to being paid on, on, on such a matter? That's what that, that rule is intended to, to fix now um i know you will you will uh, so so for 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 service to 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 the to, to to the country i think that that is encouraged that mediators should really be the, the, the calling is for them to offer services to kenyan or at least people have to to to, to tell you with what you did now, the, now that the, the, the rules will allow a review of the, the a payment schedule, at least then discussions will be done and, 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 and probably the payments can be over time, they are, they are reviewed and, a, and a, new, a new schedule is generated rather than just having one figure that runs for such a long period of uh, came in. There is someone who has asked about uh, a mentorship we did mentorship uh, before covid and he is waiting for communication from the from the from mark now I, I let me just answer it because i don't it's not part of the the rules if you are if you do a mentorship you you are you are 
be forwarded to us. If no report is prepared and forwarded to us, how will we know that you have done mentorship and how will we then communicate to you? We can't know, you have to do a report and forward to us. One, review those reports and we do update your status from mentorship to active. So you have either not looked at the list, if you did forward a report to us, you have either not looked at the you, you didn't forward a, a report to us, and without that report, there's no way we back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, yes, thank you for the comments. We, we, we seem to still be losing you, uh, especially when you are speaking at the, at, at the end, but uh, we, we got the, the earlier parts. So, but we are getting to um, uh, close to our, uh, getting to, our, to, to wrapping up. Um, the, 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 the Honorable Angela, kindly you may, uh, just for purpose of that question, you may kindly just uh, communicate um, in terms of where, if, if someone is um, visiting your offices, probably in Nairobi, where they, they go to, which particular office, and also their website, the judiciary website is where they can be able to, uh, to get the, the list of the mediators that have been uh, um, approved of, just so that there's um, clarity for the inquiry on the person who's asking about mentorship and your response. Okay. So physical reports can be forwarded to the Mediation Accreditation Committee, Supreme Court Building, uh, if you give it to us to, to a, a, a courier service, it will be it once it reaches the Supreme Court, it will be given to us. If you, you are presenting it in person, you go to room number 34. That's where our secretaries are sitting now. If you deliver it to room number 34, Supreme Court building, it will be received and we will. Uh, will act on it. You can scan it and email it to mediationaccreditation at gmail.com. We will still uh, get it, download it, and put it in your file and act on it. Uh, yeah, that is it. Guess you are muted. I am not hearing you. I don't know whether you're muted. Yes, yes. Thank you, uh, Honorable Angela, for that response. So the inquiry uh, uh, with regard to the person who's waiting for feedback on mentorship, um, it, it's tied to one that is related in terms of there would be need to reassure practitioners that they will not get delays in processes um, of, of approval, especially the ones who want to be able to practice outside. And uh, there was a comment also earlier <clears throat> when uh, uh, someone was asking, I mean, what will be the difference between an application by someone who wants to apply to be a court annexed and what is the difference of the application with someone who is not necessarily interested in becoming court annexed, but yes, they would like to go to lodge uh, private agreements. Honorable Angela? Yeah, thank you. So we haven't we haven't even made the guidelines for, for qualified for, for qualified mediators, uh, but they will be for accreditation. Uh, but all accredited mediators will definitely form the list accredited by Mac. Uh, we will we will post the list of accredited uh, of institutions where if you are accredited, then you automatically become a a letter. Uh, probably uh, institutions like NCIA, like uh, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. So if you are qualified there, if you are accredited there, you only forward. Uh, the accreditation evidence to us who are not accredited by any that you present your, your 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 documents to us we look at them and we just tell you that so you are okay and we write we give you a letter to show that it will not be an accreditation process where we are calling you for an interview to we just want to know that you are you you are trained because again, if you open up so much, you will get uh, documents from all over and from everyone, which you can't verify. So we would just want you to, to know that you are there, you are trained and you are present a settlement agreement. We will, uh, we, will make, we will make guidelines on how that will be done. So um, yes, we have, uh, uh, we'll take the one of the last uh, advanced uh, questions. Uh, thank you, Andrew Bongela, for those remarks. Uh, and uh, 
as we take uh, as we have this last advance uh, question uh, we also had uh, comments on congratulations on the great work and service to the mediation fraternity in kenya and also there was an inquiry on uh, uh, i would like to know how this document affects mediation practice in kenya which i believe as uh, we've gone on and also as you're giving us your closing remarks actually on rabo angela that is uh, what we will uh, task to you but now the very specific question that we have earlier i indicated that uh, we have we hosted sessions and uh, one of the uh, sessions we hosted was with mediation service centers in kenya and uh, the question that uh, came about is what is uh, the recognition of uh, mediation service centers or mediation centers um, in by in, in these rules and uh, 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 whether the rules would consider that there are entities that are mediation centers which could be across the country and secondly that uh, these mediation centers actually would provide even more efficiency in especially development of private mediation in this country and they actually can sub enable support the judiciary in um, or work together with the judiciary and other uh, panels in collaborating in this in this work so the it, it is a question and also a recommendation that the uh, the mediation service centers uh, gain recognition and also tied to that is also the rules also recognizing that uh, there are uh, mediation associations uh, within the country and um, this was especially brought out as a, as a question or inquiry with regards to is, are, are there any mediators and when we say any mediators uh, not necessarily from bodies that are not mediation bodies um, mediators who are com coming from mediation associations that are in Kenya, are there any of them who are sitting in the mediation, um, the, the rules, the mediation, com the mediation committee, the mark itself, and also uh, the, 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 just the entirety of the court um, annex mediation program um, in the country. So two areas with regards to the recognition of mediation um, their service centers. And then the other one is on uh, the recognition of um, the mediation associations and societies specifically. Uh, not camouflaged within other uh, bodies. Thank you, Honorable Angela. And uh, uh, when you give us a response, we'll go to uh, um, our young mediator for the month, Sam, just for his final question. And then we will come back so that we can have the closing with Professor Gishure and also with yourself. Thank you, Honorable Angela. Thank you correctly, I will, I will ask for who made that call and i'm using my phone so um okay, i don't uh, know what... sorry we missed that we missed okay we missed but did you get uh, the questions or would you like the uh, uh, for... okay so let me let me just read through what we have as the uh, the inquiry is that uh, uh, mediation centers uh, enable mediation to happen at the grassroots and uh, in kenya we have a growing body of mediation service centers from which kenyans can be able to access mediation services so what is the opportunity of recognition of in the, in the rules of the mediation centers as some of the places where Kenyans can be able to access the services? So probably let's just tackle that first. Honorable Angela. Okay. Um, yes, I, I think that's something that we need to incorporate and you will, uh, you, will you, 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 you can forward it as one of the proposals in the rules so that we, the rules recognize the, the mediation centers as uh, places where you can, uh, where the mediation services can be can can be done, especially for private mediations. But one of the things that comes on my mind when you hear that question from you, is that when we are making when we are coming up with the list of accredited of mediators uh, who will form part of the qualified uh, mediators, we can also list the the, the, the centers and the. So that if you are um, a member of a particular mediation center, or you practice there, then uh, you, you you form part of the list of qualified mediators. You only need now to come for for, for a letter. So we can recognize that so that it makes it even easier. Uh, we have a two level confirmation uh, system that you are not just working alone, and that you are also not, but you are, you are, you are working under, under a center that we can call and ask how someone is, uh, someone is doing this and this. So we, we can, we can recognize them as, as part of the, the, those institutions that are supplying to us qualified. 
but we can give another recognition again because we really want to encourage a private I think that one. It's, uh, sorry about that. We've missed the whole uh, segment of your remarks kindly, Honorable Angela. I'm, we missed a what? I'm saying we've missed, we've missed a segment of your remarks. Yeah, the internet is still playing us. Uh, yeah, kindly. If, if you're speaking right now, we cannot hear you. Sorry, someone keeps on calling. And when okay. Okay. Call, okay. Uh, Okay. So uh, the, the center, we can we can see how we can do that, have that recognition of the mediation centers in the rules. Yes, but one of the, the ways I've said is to say in our, our guidelines for qualification of, is that uh, we can recognize that if you are part of this particular association or center, then you can be part of the list of qualified okay thank you thank you for yeah thank you that was uh, that was clear um the the next part of that uh of the second uh advanced inquiry uh and then we will go to uh the mediator young mediator sum is uh does mark or or the or does mark or come the quarter next mediation program recognize the mediation associations and societies in kenya and it also comes with an inquiry is any of the associations uh do they have a representative in the mark or the any of the committees that are in the judiciary so specifically mediation associations thank you honorable angela <laughs> it depends on what what you mean by recognition uh, because that word recognition or and or accreditation has always been tricky uh, it, especially when it comes to training institutions if you say if someone says i am recognized i am accredited i am so it mean you are accredited by mark does it mean those people that you train should automatically be accredited because you are accredited by mark the how you would want to stretch the meaning of the word recognition is what matters uh and that also happens with associations centers i, I don't think we really have an issue with them because a center is is is, is, is merely a center and they are region, they operate in different regions for example you can have a, a, an outfit like the coast mediation center and they do their mediations there in mombasa that is okay but for an association and I've received requests from, from people asking to the registrar, I don't know the registrar of, of societies or so, to because you know to, 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 to inform him that the, a particular association or union is uh, is is recognized by Mark at of Kenya. Um, governing the practice of lawyers advocates in kenya now that's the challenge because what will that mean that if we we say you know you can't you can't you can't have so many associations in the same in the in the same in the, in the same field and, and some of them come as if they are competing you have an, an association of this uh, mediator as then you would want to have a recognition then they are, they are the one half of the mediators and so on. So uh, for associations, that will present a challenge. But to answer it directly, we don't have any instrument that say, tells that, uh, that, that states that we have recognized this association or at the exclusion of the other. There is no letter, there is no instrument, and there is no minutes where Mark has met as a, as a committee to say that we have accredited or recognized or acknowledged a particular society, a particular association or a particular center or a particular training institution as the one that we know at the exclusion of the other. And that has been deliberately, deliberately so also because the, to, to, to have the area thrive. It was starting and we didn't want to, to lock out other people. 
and also to, to, to not to appear as if we are leaning on one side as against the other, because we are only accrediting mediators. Now, um, the representation of Mark is, uh, is statutory. It is in the, in the civil procedure. Clearly identifies who can be members of the, of the committee. So you can't change that membership unless you change the law. And uh, the, 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 the institutions that are listed in the act, we have Kenya Bankers Association, we have the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, we have the Kenya Private Sector, is it called KEPSA? We have the, the Federation of Kenya Employers, we have the Law Society of Kenya, we have Institute of Certified Public Accountants, CISPAC, and we have secretaries, uh, ICS, inside the attorney general, and then the judiciary. The judiciary only has two people, that is the H. But all the other 11 members are from these institutions. So if, uh, if there are mediators, I don't know, it, it, it's upon those institutions to forward the names to us. But that can't be changed unless the law is changed. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that. And um, uh, we, I think it, 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 uh, for that clarification and also that communication with regard to um, what is the structure of the mark and also the committees that are there, where they are sourced from, and also about the mediation service centers. And uh, I think partly, if, if 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 it refreshes my mind, it goes back to. Uh, a comment that was uh, given in one of the advanced questions or comments or as a recommendation that there may be need to review some of the systems so that we can fully develop um, mediation uh, in Kenya. And um, it ties also with a question that came here in terms of uh, what probably does the judiciary need to do? And yeah, I think it's not just the work of the judiciary, there are several organs, which includes even us as practitioners on what needs we need to do so that mediation can yeah, continue to, or can uh, be able to ha um, have a stronger footing within the country. So allow me to kindly invite uh, young mediator uh, uh, Sam Nyamo for uh, if you have a very a burning question and also just your closing comment and then we will be able to uh, invite uh, uh, Professor Gishure also for his closing comment. Kindly, Sam. Good evening, Sam. Good evening, mediator Wangari. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I have one question, and I think the rules are silent on it. And unless I I didn't see it in the in the two bills that we were discussing, I think they're also silent on it. Um, we we have discussed accreditation of individual members, but what we, the rules have not touched on is now, for instance, as a young mediator, I'm accredited by the court. And now I want to establish my mediation practice. What, what are the guidelines? What are the requirements for me to set up my practice? Do I just register an LLP tomorrow and call it a mediation practice? Or are there certain things that it has to meet for it to qualify to be called a mediation practice? Um, I think that's my, my, my one question now at this moment. Uh, but to wrap up, I really enjoyed this session. It 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 has it has actually clarified a lot of things that I I was quite, I I had in the back of my mind, and it has really been an honor to be here with all of you. With that said, um, thank you. Asante sana, and uh, at this juncture, we would like to invite um, Honorable Anjala to please give us his uh, closing remarks, and then we will come to uh, Professor to Professor Gishure. And uh, I think uh, because we've not had the privilege to be able to see Honorable Anjala, we will invite him if he can get on video for that short closing remark. Then we can be able to uh, yes have his to know who we are talking with, perhaps Honorable Anjala kindly, and then we will come to Professor. You tried to you tried to insinuate about ghost mediators, so now we just want to be <laughs> sure. <laughs> but that, that it, yes, if it works, it but yes, because we can hear you can hear you quite well. 
that's okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, on. La- I'm laughing yeah. because you, I'm laughing because I think I, I, I put on my video shortly, briefly before when we started. <laughs> and, yeah, yes, yes, you did. Yes, you did. And yes, right you did. now, I'm not be able to put it on because um, yes, the, office that's okay. I, the office where I'm seated right now is yeah. dark. The, the internet and, is very good, so carry on. Yeah, we my, can my bar- see you. We, my, we can, my bar- we- my vibe is not working. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. it, 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 it looks like a movie. Don't worry. You look like you're in a movie. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. So, okay. yeah, carry on. So, so, before I say, maybe let me just respond to Sam's question. Uh, the rules on establishment of mediation practice. We don't want to overreach what we can do as a, 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 a under a, under these rules, because again, there always has been a problem in the law as established. Remember, we've been having discussions as to what exactly is the role of MAC. Do we accredit mediators for practice across the country? Mediation. And probably that will be addressed in the bills that, uh, that, are, that are now before the parliament, because if, for example, we take what the ADR bill is stating, then that will eventually be the role of NCIA, so that Mark is only limited to the practice in quarter next mediation. And uh, with that, we cannot want to go to address issues of putting up our mediation practice and so on, because we are only, we'll only be limited to those that are working before us, uh, so that we leave the, the other regulatory issues to a national center if it is NCIA or any other center that will then deal with that. And we only concern ourselves with the, the, the mediators that are taking part in the quota next mediation program. I, I think that's why we left that out because if we go to that regulation, we might be overstepping the mandate that we have under the act. Now, um, my closing remarks, yes, these are, this is a draft, like I said, and uh, uh, thank you for your comments on your questions and your concerns. I hope you will be able, if there are any others, prepare and look forward to them. If you can, because we want to enrich this document. This is a document that will work for us now and for the future. Uh, let's enrich it. Let's uh, ensure that it works for us and it improves the practice of mediation. It's not cast in stone. Remember the the, the, the pilot rules were in existence for less than a year. The practice directions will go. These rules will be there. If a law is changed, if a bill is passed, then again, we will have to make rules based on the law of the day. So uh, I, I think that's what I can say for now. But for now, I, uh, let's, let's see how best uh, this document can be made so that it serves us. Thank you. Asante Sana, thank you, uh, Honorable Angela, for your remarks. Uh, please pass our regards when you do uh, go go back, where, where, whichever direction you're going, where you are and where, where you're going to, kindly uh, do pass our best regards. And uh, we, are thank- we are grateful for the uh, continued co- cooperation and collaboration in uh, advancing the work of uh, professional mediation practice uh, from the Wasilena end. And also uh, on behalf of all the colleagues who are on the call today, those who are listening to it and those who have given their feedback and input um, in uh, other, other forums that we've had, uh, we, are, we are grateful that we are able to be in such dialogue. So thank you for honoring us with your time and with yourself. And uh, yeah, we are looking forward to um, other sessions that we can be able to uh, engage together. So at this juncture, allow me to kindly uh, invite uh, Professor Peter Gishure. Uh, the director of graduate school, the Catholic University of Eastern Africa, for uh, <clears throat> the director for Catholic University Eastern Africa uh, graduate school for uh, his remarks after giving us uh, his uh, commentary lecture on the role of the judiciary in conflict transformation. Professor Gishure. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, is to thank uh, uh, Honorable Moses Angela for his exposure of the 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 act and the new rules about uh, involving uh, mediators in dispute re, uh, resolution. Uh, one thing that I would like to appreciate is that we are coming of age 
and we are discovering that we we have to use all means possible to uh, to bring the constitution among our people but most important is that also those people who are not lawyers or advocates can also participate uh, again in bringing cohesion in the society so uh, the, you, do, you do not be a lawyer to be able to be a mediator and i think this is uh, the most beautiful thing so that people can also uh, be able to contribute uh, from their own area of expertise uh, to the resolution and the settlement of uh, cases and also bringing about a peace in the society through COVID transformation. Thank you very much, Avaria uh, Nemerad, for this wonderful session that we have had. Thank you. Okay. And uh, with, with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we get to the closing. And uh, today, because we do have uh, uh, Reverend Professor Peter Gishore with us, we may kindly request that you may close us off with a word of prayer. And we may all then proceed on to have a great evening and a good morning or good afternoon, depending on where somebody is. A certain sana, God bless you. Professor Gishore, kindly. OK, let's pray. <laughs> God, our Father, we thank you for this evening, for the session that we have had. We continue to ask you to bless our country so that we may be able to bring justice and peace to all people, especially those who are in dispute and in conflict. We ask you to bless all the mediators uh, present here and those who are not able to join us and to continue to bless our work. We also want to, uh, to bless you to bless uh, Moses Wanjara and all who are working hard to make sure that mediation takes root in Kenya. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, it is an opportunity for us to say good night, Honorable Angela, who is in the movies uh, right now. Uh, yes, have a please have a good night, and also everyone else. So, Asante and uh, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. God bless. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye.